go. <clears throat> oh, perfect. This sounds on too. Awesome. It's always good when the thing actually works. I'm always worried because like OBS is like notorious for like messing everything up when it updates. So hopefully uh, everything's all right. Um, I guess hello to anybody who will watch this at some point. So I have been reading this book and get up there for that thumbnail. Lectures on the Will to Know by Michel Foucault. I'm actually going to move this a little bit. I'm going to move this maybe a bit closer. Had to, had to rearrange all this stuff earlier, so now I need to set it back up for this. Um, <clears throat> so hopefully you can hear me better. Because I noticed it was like really quiet the last couple. Because for some reason, when I'm recording on OBS here, it like is um really quiet. Even though like there's no reason it should be. So I have to like manually boost the gain basically a bunch, uh, way more than I would normally do. But for some reason, I don't know why. I don't know why it does it, but I just had to like raise the volume in OBS itself. So I did that earlier. So hopefully it will at least sound maybe a bit louder when I go back. We'll find out when I go back to listen to it really. Um, so. What this is, is I guess for people who don't know, I should do a little intro here. I've been wanting to read some books and study them a bit more, you know, just like for my own purpose, because there's certain, my own kind of personal research, I guess, I don't know. Um, and so I decided to live stream, kind of live read it in order to force myself to sort of slow down and like take time to read it. And like understand each like this whole sentence because normally when i read i tend to like go too fast and skip over parts and uh don't take it all in like i should and for some of these i just want to sort of kind of force myself to slow down and read them which is what this is and i figured well why not stream it you know so maybe somebody else can benefit from it too so why not? So I'm doing the Lectures on the Will to Know by Michel Foucault, as I said. This is the first series of lectures he gave at the Collège de France, uh, where he was employed until his death in the 80s. Um, I am in the first lecture, December 9th, 1970, for the past two streams. So this one, hopefully, let me see how long I actually got. Yeah, I got like this five pages or so so my intention is to finish it today that'll be this stream so that's my goal they were he was talking about it's been a week since i read this so it he was talking about the will to know it's like the desire for people to know and to like distinguish like truth from falsity and all that um and he was talking about aristotle specifically where aristotle I guess, um, where Aristotle, um, sorry, I just noticed something weird. Um, Aristotle, uh, distinguished like that people have like a certain, what distinguishes people from like animals is a certain will to know or a pleasure and knowledge basically, uh, um, and like a whole, whole range of stuff. And Foucault is just sort of dissecting what that means. For some reason, I assume he'll get to eventually. Why? Well, I make it sound like I'm like unsure. I'm sometimes these lectures can like. Um, he'll keep saying, "Oh, I'm going to do this and this, and we're going to get to it," and like he never does, and it's like really annoying. There's a one. I think it's the birth of biopolitics lectures that's like infamous for that, because he'll constantly says, "All right, we're going to get right to." The birth of biopolitics and it's in the title and it's like we're gonna get to it we're gonna get to it and like never gets to it and it's just really funny um but we'll find out where this is going I'm just gonna get a drink of water here i'm not a i am not a Mush, a foucault es expert or a philosophy expert so i will say that so this is more of a learning experience for me and hopefully everyone else or anybody else that might find that interesting. All right.
I gotta remember where I left off though. Uh, duality. I think it is over here. All right, December 9th, 1970. So the bullet points. One, to be able to say that man naturally desires to know and that this desire is foreshadowed in the pleasure of the sensation presupposes exclusion of the theme of a transgressive, forbidden, fearsome knowledge. Now it is this theme that we find constantly in Greek tragedy and especially in a... Aeschylus and Sophocles, I don't know any Greek, so I'm going to butcher every Greek word and name I see, just for warning. The tragic hero is far from naturally desiring knowledge. In the first place, in fact, if he desires knowledge, it is not because he is moved by a natural impulse inscribed in his nature from the moment of, sen from the moment of sensation. It is because a word has been uttered from afar and above, an enigmatic word with double meaning which he does and does not understand which reassures him but nevertheless troubles him so in greek tragedy the will to know amongst like a hero character is um not a natural uh is not a natural um, innate desire, but it's from the outside. Um, what was I? There is. In the Persians, it is the question, it is the queen's draw, it, it, it is the queen's dream, the ghost of Darius. In the women of Trachis, it is a centaur's prophecy to Dianera. Heracles will be affected by magic contact so that he would so that he will never prefer any other woman. In Oedipus, of course, it is a reported rumor. Now this knowledge that is desired, because it is once obscure and promising, is a fearsome knowledge. A. In fact, it is a jeal in fact, it is jealousy, it is jealously and greedily held back by the gods. The ways of divine thought go to their end through thickets and thick shadows which no, which no gaze can penetrate. Which is a quote from Aeschylus's The Supply... The, the Suppliant... Yeah. Forget it, I'm not going to try and pronounce any of that. B. It blinds the very ones it concerns. A knowledge which watches and whose gaze dazzles those on whim it fixes. Oedipus does not... Oedipus does not look at the secret, but the secret looks at him. It does not take its eyes off him and seeks to capture him finally and seeks to capture him by finally striking him. It blinds the very ones it concerns, to the point that when the gods give up a little of their secret, the hero is the only one not rec the hero is the only one not to recognize this knowledge drawing nearer and threatening him whereas the public and the chorus already know. This is what happens to A this is what happens to Ajax. He has been he has been misled by Athena, and everyone knows this. But he does not see this fearsome presence at his side. He does not see the he does not see the great figure who is destroying him. And he employs her and he employ ah. Man, I can't pronounce stuff today. And he implores her I ask of you only to be at my side, and always allied, as you are now. C. Finally, it is a knowledge that kills. The hero does not resist it when it swoops down on him. The flash of light and death merge. The, Arist the Aristotelian themes of a knowledge which, go which goes from pleasure to happiness, of a knowledge towards which one is carried by a natural impulse, through the intermediary of words that teach and do not prophesize, and a memory without forgetfulness or enig and a memory without forgetfulness or enigma are all opposed to tragic knowledge. Elsewhere, a bit further on in the metaphysics, 
Aristotle says, the gods are not jealous. There's some end notes. I'm just going to quickly check out these end notes. All right, so that's where the plays came from. I will read the end notes sometimes in the back here if like they're interesting, but usually it's just like a citation of where a um, quote is coming from. Two, in saying that man naturally desires to know and that this desire to know is already driven by the impulse towards theoretical happiness, Aristotle rules out the so Aristotle rules out the sophistic sophistic of the sophists or Socratic sophistic question. Why do we desire to know? The question arose in multiple forms, to wit, if we desire to know out of virtue or because we already have a good nature, then why learn? We know already. Or, if we desire to learn for bad reasons, so as to get the upper hand over others, or to win unjust cases, then we will have to change in order to learn. Or the fact of learning will change the, will change the one who learns. In short, the subject of knowledge will not be the same as the subject of desire. Euthydemus, Euthydemus, to teach is to kill. Ooh, is that a quote from somewhere? Hold on. Mm. Oh, is it a Plato book? Yeah, that's what I think it might be from Plato. Uh, and behind all this emerges the big question that philosophy has not ceased to conceal precisely. Wait. And behind all this emerges the big question that philosophy has not ceased to conceal precisely and as much as its birth may not be entirely foreign to it. Can knowledge be sold? Can it, on the one hand, be closed upon itself like the precious object of greed and possession? And on the other hand, can it enter into the game of circu can it enter into the game and circulation of wealth and goods? I think I'm actually going to quickly write something down relating to a previous thing there. Knowledge. but was given from outside. To the view of by Aristotle. Let me get a drink. Ah. <clears throat> It's been a while since I've read. I normally like try and read out loud every morning for like some audiobook stuff I've done, but I haven't done that recently. And so I can tell, it, they can tell my voice starts to uh, get a bit frazzled. Find it impossible to read without, yeah. Normally I can like, um, Sometimes I, a book I'll just like read, you know, without taking notes, but for, I've been trying to study like Foucault a bit more to like understand some of his stuff and then I have to take notes or else I won't remember. I'll remember like little tiny bit, but, um, yeah, but for here right now, yeah, so I've been like you know, reading Discipline and Punish, and that was taking a bunch of notes on it. Um, but yeah, so like, the short answer is on the same. Like, I can't remember a whole lot when I, if I don't take notes. Um, where was I? 
like right now, I should have uh, noted where I left off, right? Yeah, there we go. For if knowledge is a thing we desire, why would it not be a, why would it not be a good like why would it not be a good like others entering like them into the universality of money? Aristotle rules out this question by placing the desire to know well before the completion of knowledge at the lowest level, that of sensation, by seeing to it nevertheless, by seeing to it nevertheless, that this desire belongs already to knowledge, since it is in the sen since it is in sensation that knowledge first appears. Desire is enclosed within knowledge, but knowledge is not given but knowledge is not given that's a typo I think in there. But knowledge is not given entirely with desire. I'm actually going to write that down too. That was interesting. Aristotle places desire well before completion. Of knowledge at the lowest level sensation. <clears throat> um, in sensation and knowledge. First appears. Oh, mm -hmm. Still, through this assertion of the natural character of the desire to know, Aristotle rules out the Plato Aristotle rules out the Platonic theme of memory in the super celestial world. On the one hand, in Aristotle, the desire to know is foreshadowed at the level of and in sensation and in sensations. The desire to know is not linked to the project of getting free from them and going beyond them in order to find a truer reality. Quite the reverse. If there is a danger, it is, that one it is that one does not get free of them. On the other hand, memory, which is indeed indispensable to the desire to know, connaître, in the whole of its movement, is linked to sensation, since it is persistence and trace. The desire to know, savoir, does not move away from fantasia. It is inscribed in it and depends on it. Nevertheless, we see that in ruling out the platonic theme, Aristotle resolves the same problem as Plato. At least, he complies with the same theoretical requirement. Namely, to ensure that the will to know is not founded on anything other than the precondition of knowledge itself. To ensure that to ensure that the desire to know is enveloped entirely within knowledge. To ensure that knowledge has already absorbed it from the start, and that, on its first appearance, it thus gives it it thus gives it it thus gives it its place, its law, and the principle of its movement. Plato satisfied this requirement the myth of recollection, even before you know, even before you desire to know, you knew, you had already known. We are accustomed to re we are accustomed to reading the theory of recollection as not only the correlate of the transcendence of ideas, but also as a way of connecting knowing and desiring to know, and desiring to know to each other. Actually, this theory should be read as a way of lodging the desire to know within knowledge. By placing the mem meme in the very tracks of sensation, Aristotle Aristotle completely changes the arrangement, but he makes it play the same role. But he makes it play the same role. In his nature in its nature 
action, and power, the desire to know is not outside the knowledge it desires. The Aristotelian text thus pursu the Aristotelian text thus presupposes the exclusion of three themes: that of tragic knowledge, savoir; that of learning, commodity; and that of knowledge, connaissance, memory. But like Plato, albeit in a different way, he seeks to protect knowledge from the exteriority and violence of desire. The desire to know is no more than a game of knowledge in relation to itself. It does no more than show its genesis, delay, and movement. Desire is knowledge deferred, but made visible in the impatience of the sus in the impatience of the suspense in which it is held. Okay. Aristotle seeks to protect knowledge <clears throat> the consequences of this, the consequence of this envelopment and much more in Aristotle than in Plato is that knowledge savoir and desire are not in two different places possessed by two subjects or two powers but that the one who desires knowledge is already the one who possesses it or is capable of possessing it or is capable of possessing it. And it is without violence, appropriation, and struggle, without commerce too, but by the simple but by the simple actualization of his nature, that the one who desires to know will indeed end up knowing. A single subject goes from desire to know, savoir, to knowledge, connaissance, for the good reason that if knowledge were not there as precedence of the desire the desire itself would not exist. So, who can desire? Each needs I think I'll drink again. Yeah. Thirsty day. <clears throat> And conversely, the desire to know is in its nature already something like knowledge, something belonging to knowledge. It cannot want knowledge for something other than itself, since it is starting from knowledge that it wishes to know. Knowledge is at once its, ob knowledge is at once its object, its end, and its material. This is why, on the one hand, in the diversity of desires, there will be that singular, separate, and serene desire that we will call curiosity, the desire to know for the sake of knowing, etc. And on the other hand, we will not acknowledge we will not acknowledge any violence, will to domination, or force of exclusion and rejection in this desire. The game of exteriority of desire and knowledge is replaced by a mutual belonging of each other of each to the other, a mutual a mutual belonging of each to the other. The envelopment of the first by the second in something like co-naturalness. Hence we understand one, the need to lodge the need to lodge both of them in a same agency, same soul, same same subject, same consciousness. Two, the scandal making will and desire emerge outside knowledge. 
as Nietzsche and Freud have done. And three, the difficulty of thinking philosophically a will to know, savoir, that would derive in advance from the unity of a knowing, connaissance, knowing subject. In order to fix the vocabulary, let us say that we will call knowledge, connaissance, the system that allows desire and knowledge, savoir, to be given a prior unity, reciprocal belonging, and co-naturalness. All right, that seems like something I should write down. So knowledge, connaissance, the system that allows desire and knowledge, knowledge if I can spell right, to be given a prior unity, to be given a prior unity. I like that co-naturalness. <clears throat> and we will call knowledge savoir that which we have a drag, that which we have to drag from the interiority of knowledge connaissance in order to rediscover in it the object of a willing, the end of a desire the instrument of a domination, the stake of a struggle. All right, so that knowledge, so far. So it's, Inside knowledge, is necessary Object of the end of desire. Hmm. Very, very good pronunciation. I'm actually from the Midwest of the United States, but it's a Forced pronunciation, I should say. I normally like I mumble a lot, but uh, for this, I kind of you kind of like hearing my I've heard my voice recording stuff like this a lot, and you start to realize, oh, I mumble a lot, so it's like you have to like force yourself to enunciate words. So that's uh less from where I'm at. But more of, more of like practice, I guess. Like, you do it enough, eventually it's like, you kind of naturally fold into a slow. Well, hopefully, my goal is to kind of naturally get a bit, kind of that slow, you know, clear pronunciation. That's my hope. That's my goal. I think. I guess it's working. I don't know. Sometimes it feels like, on my end. I'm stumbling over words a lot, but <clears throat> um, where was I? The stake of a struggle. Let's stand back a bit again. For centuries, there has existed a theme. There has existed a theme. What? For centuries, there has existed. There has existed a theme of the ban of 
the banality of which induces weariness. That's a weird... I think this is like taken... This is either taken from like a transcript. I know they like recorded him. Or from people's notes. So sometimes there's like words missing that either like person taking the notes didn't write down and that feels like one of them for centuries there has existed a theme of the banality of which induces weariness which is that ultimately everyone is a bit of a which is that ultimately everyone is a bit of a philosopher it is a theme immediately dismissed by philosophical discourse in order to develop the theme that philosophy is a specific task set back set back and at a distance from all others and irreducible to any other. But it is a theme no less regularly taken up again by philosophical discourse in order to assert that philosophy is nothing other than the movement of truth itself, that it is consciousness becoming aware of itself, or that the person who wakes up to the world is already a philosopher. But we should note that this theme, ever dismissed and taken up again, of a philosophy linked to the, of a philosophy linked to the first movement of knowledge in general, is a theme which would have appeared very foreign to the first Greek philosophers. But more importantly, we can see the function it performs. There is already contemplation the crudest and most physical knowledge. It is this contemplation then that will lead to the whole movement of knowledge according to a specific logic or the necessity of the object it contemplates. As a result, desire is alighted along with, along with its effectiveness. Desire is no longer cause, but knowledge that becomes cause of itself on the basis of the idea or the sensation of obviousness or of the impression or of the impression no matter. Ka Wait. There's a big, there's a parenthesis there. Hold on. Desire is no longer, desire is no longer cause, but knowledge that becomes cause of itself, cause of itself, and the desire direct, and the desire directed towards it. It's kind of an awkward break there. You have that. And as a consequence, the subject of desire and the subject of knowledge are one and the same. The sophistical problem, the person who does not yet know and desires cannot be the person who knows and no longer desires, is erased. The strange discussion of the oh, euthydemus, the strange discussion of the euthydemus in which a sophist says, if you want your friend to learn, he must no longer be the same, he must die, this ironic eruption of death between the subject of desire and the subject of knowledge can now be erased, for desire is no more than the scarcely perceptible quivering of the subject of knowledge around what he knows. The old millennial theme of everyone is more or less a philosopher has a precise and ascribable, and ascribable function in Western history. It is a matter of it is a matter of no more or less than sealing up the desire to know and knowledge itself. And that is the end of the first lecture there. And I'm going to quickly get a drink. <clears throat> I'm just going to take a quick rest there. Oh, it's been a while. Like, it's been a couple of days with a weekend, and then I was busy um, this week and earlier last week. I didn't get to do a whole lot of reading out loud. And I noticed that if I take time from not doing that, like, regularly, it I get tired when I first start doing when I get back into it. <clears throat> Oh. Yeah. Oh, you're in Sweden? That's pretty neat. <clears throat> it's 
It's weird. I wouldn't expect somebody from Sweden to be watching. Yeah. It can be like, you know, your normal like day-to-day -day speaking of like any language, you know, that's pretty simple. But then once you start getting into philosophy, you get really like abstract terms and stuff doesn't translate very well. That's when it gets a bit funky. Especially with like, you know, I'm reading like, you know, Foucault has a lot where it's like certain words that he uses just don't translate into English very well. And um, I don't know where I was going with that, but yeah. Um, so like here, I think an interesting example of that here is knowledge, where in French is two words for knowledge or to know. To know has two words, which is savoir and connaître. So um, they keep having to distinguish which one he's talking about. And presumably, if I was like French, I would know the difference. Like I know like how they're used, kind of. I know that they're kind of, I know that they're used differently. But there's like a whole philosophical, like, I'm sure like tradition of like savoir versus connaître. And there's like some deep meaning behind using one of the other but in english it's like you know we just know things there's nothing that doesn't happen there's no like one word for it and i don't even know if like yeah something like that i'm kind of ccru yeah but that was uh because i know like ccru has like lots of just words they made up like that's like the first time uh someone used that word was in ccru writing somewhere which is neat i mean it's neat that like they can be experimental with that but i was actually thinking of that like because someone asked me uh at one point who was um from italy they're like well there's no translation of the ccru and i got to thinking of that like how would you even translate some of that like you know most of it would be fine but like there's lots of weird terms that like probably have no like italian version um or like any language outside of english because just like um nicolaian just made it up then like that's just the first that's just, he just made it up or like took a normal word and just yeah it's funny it's a uh, i don't know it's an, it's an interesting thing like i guess and like it would change like the whole meaning of it especially like ccru which is like a pretty like um oh like esoteric like even when you under even like in in even in english it like doesn't make sense a lot of it uh i can't imagine i can't imagine trying to read it like without you know not being fluid in english like you know having to try and translate that in some into like another language even uh i've been reading a lot of deleuze recently or reading like not a lot i guess but kind of taking him a bit more seriously and reading it and so ccru is like heavily influenced by deleuze um and now it's like when I, I read like Anti Oedipus and a Thousand Plateaus, and then went back and read CCRU, and I was like, oh, is it, that's where all that came from, and like, I now like and realize like, man, I really misinterpreted like lots of stuff, and um, it I won't I won't say that it made more sense, but it was like a little bit more clear at least like the i don't know certain parts of it were like oh all right okay i see this is clearly a reference to deleuze or like that deleuze influence coming out but yeah ccre is pretty fun it's a nice it's one that is why i like about it is that like each time i come back to it i get more out of it because i've like read 
more of the philosophy that Nick Land was working with. And like, I can come back to it and see, oh, all right. I can kind of see like that was obviously like a reference to a thousand plateaus or, you know, um, some weird to lose thing. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's actually a really good point. Deterritorializing language and, uh, yeah. Yeah, I really like how you put that. I might, yeah. Yeah, it's a really fun, CCRE's fun. I've been reading for this channel, going back and reading, like there's a book, stuff that was published in the book, like the CCRE writings, and there's like a lot of other ones that weren't. And also a lot of um, stuff that people built on it, like later on, like I finished um, Spinal Catastrophism, which is one of those books where like someone was building on it. Um, and, you know, it's just a lot of fun reading it and some like really wonderful passages in it. And yeah, <clears throat> I'm going to get another drink here. And I think I might. What time is it? I think I might finish, uh, or not finish. I will start the next lecture here. I wasn't sure if I was. I was like, well, it's like, I'll have like one stream just for like finish it up. But I got through it pretty quick. So I think I will start Cyclonopedia. No, I haven't. I have not read um, Cyclonopedia. I want to though. I like, that's one of the ones that I've wanted wanted to read I might actually I was thinking of it reading it like stream reading it um like getting a copy and doing this but I'd probably like sit down or like I don't know I don't know what notes I would take but reading it for out loud that was one of those things I was thinking of doing very interesting yeah I read like the first section yeah I read like like first couple pages, but um, somebody else was sending me like some pictures randomly of of it. Like, man, it sounds like really cool. I want to read that. So yeah, I might do that. I would just. I'm always looking for like books to like. Doing this format, I want like a physical book. So like, I don't know. I just like to have a physical book in front of me. So uh. Forty percent, yeah. I might, so I might read that here. And I was thinking, so I'm like, anyways, I was like thinking of like having like a physical book. So it would be, it would depend on that if I can get a physical copy. I mean, I guess it's not that big of a deal breaker. I can do a screen recording or, you know, whatever. But um, that is one of the things I was thinking of that or like Fang Numina or which I need to read that. Um, or I think who else? Mark Fisher. Uh, was another CCRU guy. I need to read his stuff. There's a lot of like CCRU stuff I haven't read. You know, I've read the writings. I've been going through the website to read that. Kind of trying to do it like systematically, I guess. Like start with like the first stuff and then what did each person do after that kind of thing. But um, yeah, that's a one of the questions I always think about. Like what else should I do on here? But um, anyways... <clears throat> I think I will start this next one. It's like eight different words for oil, super. Yeah. Um, I was reading. Um, what was I reading by? Because it's by uh, Negus. I'm not going to try and pronounce his name. But I was reading another thing by his. A essay he wrote. An essay he wrote in... Um, uh, the Collapse Philosophy Journal, which Collapse is like the uh, philosophy journal started by, um, it was originally back in the 90s with the CCRU, like all those guys published a journal, and then it was rebooted um, in the early 2000s, I think, and um, so like lots of the same people wrote in that, and I was reading that, and he was talking about like, terrorism and then went to full like set theory um 
just this abstract math stuff, like geometry. And it was so weird and crazy and it was great. I didn't understand like any of it. And like, it, it, you, it starts out like simple. Oh, I'm just going to talk about uh, terrorism, like why it happens. Like, oh, all right. And then just like goes completely off and it was great. I love just that kind of weird stuff. Yeah, it's, um, oh, it was the very, it was the first volume of Collapse, which is, uh, um, the, the journal, some journal that, um, Robin McKay, I think, published through Urbanomic. I'm trying to remember. Yeah, it was one, I got it for, actually for Christmas, and so I was reading, uh, I was reading it and uh, I mean, I wanted to like work through those two. So I got the first one, which was like numbers and it was pretty interesting. Uh, the Neg Garistani one was interesting. There was one by, or an essay in there about prime numbers, but I forget who wrote it. And uh, it was pretty cool. Just like how like weird and cool prime numbers are. And uh, then... I think that that was like those two, I think really stood out to me. Um, Nega, Nega star Ronnie. I, I know I'm mispronouncing that. Yeah. There's like interviews. Uh, and the, I'm completely blanking. Yeah. I've been like wanting to like, research a bit more like ccr i might check out like an interview like interviews and stuff to check out so like more research on it and stuff because it's a strange little thing that happened in england in the 90s it's just a i don't know it's just like really interesting just like what they were doing there just like weird stuff even like not you know it makes itself purposely they act weird but the actual stuff they were doing wasn't Lovecraftian, but it was still like pretty strange. Um, <clears throat> anyways, I know I've said this like twice already, three times. I'm just gonna get a drink here. Now we'll do a little bit of this. So, <clears throat> chapter two, December 16th, 19th, December 16th, 1970. And this one, this section I do remember was shorter because it like the end of this lecture and the beginning of the next one, there was a big chunk on Nietzsche, which they didn't have in here, but he then gave it his own separate lecture somewhere else, which they, the transcript of that, they published in here. I'm, I do remember, because I've read like, the first couple lectures in here. And I remember that was being a footnote, which is weird. I don't, it's like a weird thing to do, I guess. I don't know. K files. Video explore. Yeah, I might check that out. Yeah. I know they, them. Yeah. I'll add that to the list of, uh, podcast there's like a couple philosophy podcasts i've been wanting to um listen to i think acid horizon and um the machinic unconscious happiness hour i think it was called um i've been reading to like i've been listening to some acid horizon acid horizons to lose stuff but i'll check that other one out too uh when i get or to get more CCR, especially like Mark Fisher, who I'm also interested. I need to read his stuff. Like I need, I see capitalist realism, capitalist realism recommended a bunch, but um, I have yet to read it for some reason. I just never read it, so I will probably do that. I, that was another one I was thinking maybe save for here on stream. Hmm. All right, I'm going to read just a little bit of this. Let's see, how long is this? Why well, I could almost do this in one day. Well, hold on. I'm just thinking thinking ahead here for a minute. 
Okay, so January 6th is pretty long. Yeah, all right, I'll do like part of this. Last week, I tried to analyze an apparently quite commonplace passage from Aristotle. It concerns a desire to know in its natural character. But by studying the terms a bit more closely, I saw that this, I saw that this natural desire to know was shown, first of all, by a pleasure taken in a useless sensation. A triple displacement revealed two things. <clears throat> One, there is knowledge of the root of desire. Restart that. One, there is knowledge at the root of desire. Even before it manifests itself, even before it manifests itself and starts to function. A knowledge that is still sensory, of course, but a knowledge nonetheless. A knowledge already there on the basis of which the desire could unfold. So that knowledge is pri so that knowledge is prior to the desire for it, and the desire was itself nothing other than a sort of inner retardation of knowledge. Ooh, politically incorrect word there. Um, with regard to itself, a desire correlative to the period that retarded knowledge in order to ah. <laughs> a desire correlative to the period that retarded knowledge in order to arrive in one go at its true nature, and namely contemplation. Two, but this triple displacement also shows something else. In fact, in Aristotle's text we saw that the sensation could be considered as a legitimate example of knowledge. The reason for this, the reason for this was that it had access to truth, to things themselves and their specific qualities. We also saw that if one could take a certain form of pleasure in the sensation, this was because the sensation was capable of presenting itself to us as the advanced figure of contemplation, that is to say, of knowledge and truth in itself. Finally, we saw that this pleasure is linked to the very uselessness of the sensation, that is to say, to the fact that the... <clears throat> oh. That is to say, to the fact that the role of the sensation is not merely to serve animal life and its needs, but they can, but that it can have access itself, but that it can have access itself to the truth. In short, underneath the text is spoke of a sort of natural desire to know, and seemingly prior to any knowledge, beneath this text, there are two operations: one that reintroduced knowledge underneath desire, and at its very source and the other, even more hidden, that introduced, truth as a, that introduced truth as a third element between desire and knowledge. All the arguments and proofs found in Aristotle's other texts, and by which this triple displacement can be justified, presuppose that sensation and its pleasure are connected with, tr are connected with truth. If there is a desire to know in general, and if knowledge can give rise to something like desire within its own movement, it's because everything already takes place in the realm of truth. Truth as, guar truth as guarantee and foundation of the desire to know. Now I think ultimately that this is the most important point. In order to effectuate the transition from, in order to effectuate the transition from desire to knowledge, there is there had to be truth. I'm going to write that down. Since it was important. He said it was important, so I better write it down. Transition. It is because it is already a question of truth in the desire that the desire can be desire for knowledge. Conversely, 
it is because the relationship it is because the relationship to truth is fundamental the desire that the desire for knowledge already belongs in itself at its root to the domain of knowledge and finally it is because the relationship to truth commands both knowledge and desire that they can have only one and the same subject the subject of knowledge and the subject of desire can be considered the Wait, let me redo that. The subject of knowledge and the subject of desire can be considered the same, since they have the same relationship to truth. Since they have the same relationship to truth. Hmm. <clears throat> I think I'm going to write more of that down, but I'm actually going to stop here. Yeah, I've been going for an hour, so I'm actually going to stop here. Uh, thanks to I Do Not Sell Stolen CDs. Uh, it was nice talking to you, and I'm going to stop there, and I might be back. I started doing the streams on, like, the weeks that, like, I'm actually busy and, like, have, uh, I don't know, like, this my schedule of stuff I have to do changes randomly, so um, I might be back either tomorrow I like I want to do like two elite like two streams a week I think and so I might be back tomorrow I think I'm busy Friday so that's why I, tomorrow but I'm not going to commit to that because it might be Friday or it might you know I might just wait till next week so um I like I like this time though because I was doing like a three like three or four the last two times but i like um doing it earlier now it feels like less pressure to finish i don't know but um so uh thanks for uh everyone who showed up and yeah oh computer science that was never uh never my thing i was i took one computer science class and it was like uh not very fun. I did not have fun with that. It's around almost, yeah. All right, yeah, yeah, you're in Sweden, right? So that's going to be pretty late. Here it's like uh, three o'clock in the afternoon. Um, so I guess I'll hit, I'll hit that European evening d demographic, right? Um, but anyways, so um, I'll probably, I'm going to try, and I will try to do one tomorrow, probably about the same time, but I cannot guarantee it because, like I said, for some reason I decided to do all this right on the week that I was busy with, like, lots of stuff. But, uh, so thanks for everyone who showed up, and I will see you either Thursday, either Friday, or next week, and we will continue reading The Will to Know. Let me grab my mouse. Oops. And have a nice evening and good luck studying for exams and see ya.